بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا. So we are starting this new class tonight at the Islamic Center. Uh, it's essentially focused on looking at foundations and kind of fundamental essentials of the religion on a whole. Um, over the course of however many of the next weeks, we'll go through just kind of the basis of theology, spirituality, ritual and practice in our tradition. Today we're going to go through a lot of technical terms um, to give you kind of an overarching understanding. Um, we're going to discuss this from the standpoint of uh, Sunni tradition. Um, I studied uh, Hanafi texts um, and we'll get into what all these words mean. Uh, over the course of the time we spend together um, and when we're looking at it from the standpoint of theology um, we're going to also be looking at it through the standpoint of what's understood to be Sunni normative theology as well but because it's a foundations class you'll see kind of a lot of it has overlap um, within various theological spectrums. Um, a part of the class will also just be about how do we kind of engage with things on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, there's some of you in this room who have been Muslim your whole life. There's some of you who converted to Islam years ago, months ago, weeks ago. There's some of you who are of other walks of life and you're just exploring Islam as a religion, uh, either for a personal journey, your own spiritual kind of exploration, academically, whatever the case might be. But it's a very diverse group of people, as well as those who are joining us virtually. Um, and so where and how we kind of go is going to be at a very slow pace. We're going to define terms um, so that we have a relationship to terms. Uh, we're going to spend some time really trying to extrapolate meaning from things so that it's not just kind of rote, regurgitated understandings, right? Where I throw words at you and you memorize them, but you don't have a relationship to them. Right, the idea is to also not confine ourselves to text in the context of being written for distinct audiences centuries ago, where a lot of manuals on Islamic law and a lot of texts on Islamic theology were also written with primary audiences in mind. And the kind of things that they're discussing and dealing with, in large part at answering questions of theology, of practice, of spiritual dilemma rooted in what's immediately in front of them in that moment. And it's not that you can't pull from that necessarily, but we have to be able to pull from it in a way that also renders an understanding of where we are contemporarily at this time. Does that make sense? Right? And to give a context also that we're trying to create an opportunity that is distinct because learning modes traditionally in our religion had people literally walk all over the earth to find knowledge and it was sometimes very hard for people to gain access to information. We have the opposite challenge where these days information is so easily accessible and the ability to kind of understand well how does that really apply to me or how do I make sense of this? We had a young woman in our community who is a recent convert to Islam who converted right around the time of one of our major holidays uh, that's called Eid al-Adha, right? It's within the days of Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and it follows within the rites and traditions of the Abrahamic narrative, the Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, his wife Hajar, peace be upon her, their son Ismail, peace be upon him. and she was really excited. I'm Muslim now. I'm going to celebrate with my sisters and brothers. And then a week later I saw her and she's in my office and she's in tears. And I said, what's going on? And she said, I looked up how we celebrate this holiday and it said, I have to go and sacrifice a goat. And she said, I don't even know where to buy a goat. And she said, do I kill this thing in my apartment? And I was like, don't kill any animals. <laughs> right? don't try to buy a goat on Amazon. <laughs> like, it's not, you know, anything that you're thinking. But why wouldn't she think that based off of what she read? 
and what she read was not written for someone like her in mind and she's just trying to do what she thinks God wants her to do you see and she's getting lost in terminologies as she's kind of trying to listen to things through sound bites on TikTok and Instagram reels. She's getting lost in articles that were translated from other languages into an English that is very archaic. She doesn't know what to do when she looks up a video or a podcast and anything that you search yields you millions of things and most often are things that are rooted in why you shouldn't listen to that person or why this person's a problem and it's very reactive in a negative way and she's like i'm just trying to learn how to pray there's not real kind of nuanced translations to things right and it just creates a lot of conundrums so what we want to do just so everyone's on the same page right we have a community that's very large and very diverse we are in a place where in a given week, anywhere from one to five people reach out to us who want to learn more about Islam, they want to convert, take their shahada. If you were here on Monday night for the other halakha that I do, uh, it you know was started with a woman who came and she sat and she converted to Islam, mashallah, right? May Allah you know, make things easy for her. But it's a common kind of occurrence here. Um, and now, kind of as we're settling in more post-COVID and we're in a place where we're structuring things more, um, for that specific demographic, we want to provide a resource. And thereafter, we want to also be in a place where we understand that many in our community who are even born into Islam are in a place where it's not an inherited practice, right? Just because you have the label of Islam doesn't mean that there's like a structured approach to your learning and the ability to access information in and of itself becomes something that's very critical uh, in every dimension of Islam, right? Not just the legalistic, which we're gonna do an intro to today, um, but seeing how all of it kind of synergizes together. There's gonna be books that we're gonna look at and I'm gonna give you some names right now. You don't have to get all of them and we'll have notes put up. There's, uh, as we talk about what is like legal development, right? The kind of prayer and fasting and, you know, how you wash up for prayer and pilgrimage and these things. Um, there's methodologies that we'll look at within the Sunni tradition. There's a great book in English, it's called The Four Imams. It was written like probably when some of you were maybe five years old, right? Uh, it's got like a goldish yellow color um, written by a person by the name of Abu Zahra. And it just goes through the biographies, kind of the methodologies, the techniques implemented by the four founders of the canonical schools of Sunni um, legal thought. And we'll talk about those over the course of our time together. There's a text called Being Muslim um, that was written by a person named Asad Tarsan that was written in particular for those who are converts, new to Islam. It's going to go through just foundational theology, spirituality, ritual practice. Um, there's some Hanafi fiqh texts that we'll look at just to introduce you to them. They're like primer legal texts and a little intermediate and advanced. Um, but to be able to draw from them, right? Because a typical manual, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a little bit, is written just to teach somebody how to pray, but not why they pray in the ways that they pray. Right? There's two billion Muslims in the world. You don't have to know the basis of it in order to do it. Right? So somebody says, when you wash up, you wash these parts, and you wash those parts, and then that's it. But what I'd like for us to do is to also say, well, here's like the verse of the Quran that says this is the basis for these parts of that ritual washing. Right? So that you can kind of engage the text kind of understand it, you know, within the context of where you are, and it allows for like a little bit deeper of, a, of an interaction. Do you know what I mean? Right? Does that make sense? Um, I know we're like all kind of coming in different places, and so we're going to just cater to the lowest common denominator. And the assumption is that we want to kind of offer, you know, everything with as much detail as possible from the onset and then just go from there, right? 
Any questions, any thoughts, anything that comes up for people as we're discussing that? Yes, no? Yeah, I'm going to bring them with me like books as we look at them and we'll put notes up and share with you all. And you should take notes, right? It's not like a class that's about inspiration or kind of just sharing stories. There'll be stories to illustrate points. Um, but there's going to be like a lot of words that we're going to define because you're just going to come across them, you know? And there's certain words that just, they don't necessarily translate well. But there's also words that you find that we use in our religious tradition that just appear in numerous languages also because they retain their original form. Do you know what I mean? Right, like in a lot of languages, people use the name of God in our tradition as Allah, right? They're not translating it in any way, right? Um, the giving of like a greeting of peace, assalamu alaikum, you know, stays the same, right? There's certain things that you just also can't translate so well, but we don't want to do that. We want to get to it at a deeper level. So words like taqwa, which people will translate as piety, consciousness, you know, mindfulness, these kinds of things. You just want to be in a place where somebody says the word taqwa and you're like, yeah, I know what that is, right? Iman is a word for faith, theology. But we want to just say, well, what does this word mean? So I don't have to kind of be in a place where it is something that I see as kind of a distinct language, but it can exist in that form even when we're speaking in English. You see what I'm saying? Like it doesn't have to be kind of Englishized, so to speak, but it can just become part of our regular lexicon as English speaking Muslims. Do you, does that make sense? What I'm saying, right? Okay. Any other thoughts, questions, things that are coming up for people before we get started? Yeah, as we go through it, there's going to be a bunch of things that we'll share, that we'll show some of the, what we're going to do. So we'll break it into like chunks, right? We'll be together for like an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. We'll have kind of a third that's just kind of dedicated um, to things that are going to be like how-tos, right? So next week when we talk about washing up for prayer, what's called wudu in Arabic, um, we're just going to show you how to do it. Right? We'll bring some water in here. We'll go step by step. You know, we'll have people that are helping to demonstrate it. You can go into the ablution rooms, right? Try. And as we go through this and we're situating the program more, we'll have people that can help us too, like buddies, mentors, these kinds of things. When we go through prayer, right? We're going to like walk through the prayer, its motions, its mechanics, right? It's not just kind of front facing lecture, but interactive so that you can go through it. And when we get through this at a foundational level of framing, so we can talk about the specifics, right? We can talk about like, what does this have to do, the form with like spirituality? What does any of this have to do with God fundamentally, right? All of you are not converts or looking to convert, but a common convert experience, which is probably very common for many of us who are born into Islam too, is that at some point it just stops being about God, right? The conversations, are just devoid of discussions about the divine. And it's just the mechanics and just the do's and don'ts. And that becomes something that's, you know, quite often very hollow. Not that it's like hollow in the sense that it's pointless, but doesn't then have that inner aspect to it. Do you know what I mean? And I could put you in front of like a hundred converts that I know. And they'll say, after I became Muslim, everything just stopped being about God. Everybody was just telling me, now you gotta do this, now you gotta do that, and this is what's right, and this is what's wrong. Everything in this religion goes back to God. Like, that's just the basis of it. We're gonna talk about some of these things and frame it in some different ways, and it's just gonna be ongoing. You know, we'll keep going with it through the summer, through, you know, um, in Ramadan, we might kind of take a hiatus or change the day, because like, iftar, our breaking of our fast will come in the middle. Um, so a couple of other principles, right? We're all coming from very different places. I like to have people talk to each other. Um, just be mindful that the persons you're sitting next to um, and you're speaking with, it's not about kind of right or wrong always, right? Um, and we're here as sisters and brothers um, and not as kind of, you know, individuals who are gonna say to the person next to me, no, 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 it's like has to be this way, right? 
So there's a question. Just let those of us who are facilitating answer the question. So it creates ease in terms of this kind of the balance in the space, right? Um, and being in a place where as people are talking, you're like listening to them, right? Because everything is not the same for everybody. You know, we all don't have the same family support or family challenges. We all don't have the same community experience or upbringing. We all don't come from the same socioeconomic backgrounds, the same racial backgrounds, the same cultural backgrounds. We don't all have this broader we that exists and we want to be mindful of that as what we talk about that's on an abstract or theoretical still has elements of somebody saying, but how do I do this in my day? Right, I still have trying to figure out how to be Muslim in this world. Do you see? In the context of a family that doesn't know I practice Islam. Whether that family is Muslim themselves or not. Because you'd be surprised how many Muslim families don't really want their family members to be so Muslim or too Muslim. You know? Does that make sense? Right? And where and how you can kind of stick through with us because classes will build upon themselves. You can't be here in person, log on online, like watch the videos. Um, but there's concepts that we'll talk about that are going to kind of grow into each other, right? And this is what we're going to be looking at fundamentally. Do you know what I mean? Anything else? Thoughts, framing questions, conversations that come to mind? Yes, no, yeah. Um, are we going to go in depth for like the different schools of thought? Uh, probably not in this class, just because what we're hoping to get out of this is that people build like a fundamental relationship with what's obligatory upon them. They have a basic knowledge of like theology um, and just a basic knowledge also of like how to navigate daily interactions with Muslims as well as kind of people of other backgrounds, right? So like it's really hard if you are hearing people say all kinds of words like inshallah, mashallah, tabarakallah and you don't know what it means so we're gonna use a chunk of our day to say this is what all these people are saying when they're saying these words to you right this is how like we kinda help each other you know um, and so it's not like a class on what's called usul of fiqh or Islamic legal theory that's gonna get into the nuances of legal theory but those are things like we can get into as we kind of move forward. Um, I'll talk about it briefly in light of like some of the things, just so people can understand, well, what's the distinctions in kind of the methodologies? Because you're going to run into people who do it differently, you know, and you're gonna to want to know, well, like, why is it like that? And what's the basis of that? Do, does that make sense, right? Okay, anything else? Yes, no, great. What's also great is like, at any point you have a question just ask so that we're able to like take a pause and try to like distill it um, and if you could share names if you're comfortable when you're speaking so we can learn each other's names right if you come on Monday like the holika we do on Monday you know this past Monday I think had like 100 150 people in it right it's very different than when you have like 20 people in a room and we can create more of a learning experience but also like learning together and not learning as individuals just in a room like simultaneously. You see what I mean? Yeah? Does that, does that make sense? Okay, great. So where I want to start is just kind of in a foundation um, and to give an understanding first of like, well, what makes somebody Muslim, you know? What Islam is rooted in as a religion, like any other religions, is a theological basis. And there's certain things that Muslims believe theologically in order to be Muslim across the board. What are some of those things? Does anybody know? Like what's one? Yeah, go ahead. Great, so right at the top, there's a belief in one God. So if somebody says, I'm Muslim, but I don't believe in God, or I'm Muslim, but I believe that there's more than one God, that's outside of the categorical definition of what a Muslim is. I'm not saying go tomorrow and start talking to people 
and saying, do you really believe in God? Then you're not Muslim, right? That's not what I'm talking about. But so we can have an understanding of what makes somebody Muslim at a fundamental level and then seeing how that informs things like practice, spirituality, other things that we just engage in day to day. So one God, what else? Yeah, so you have a finality of prophethood in the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Which if somebody says, I'm Muslim, but I don't believe that Muhammad was a prophet. Or if somebody says, I'm Muslim, but I believe there's a prophet after the prophet Muhammad. This also then becomes a challenge to the foundational theology of Islam. Right? What's the last one? There's three. Yeah. The Quran can be connected to messengerhood and prophecy. Yeah? Yeah, kind of. So what's the broader category that resurrection would fall under? Day of judgment? Yeah. So just, just afterlife, right? The idea that like this world isn't it. It's not a nihilistic religion. You know, it's not a religion that also is rooted just in like a finite world and then there's nothing that comes after. But there's a belief in afterlife. And these things are going to be important to understand when we talk about things like ritual and practice. They're going to formulate for us kind of the grounds of like why certain things are done the ways that they're done. Do you know what I mean? And more or less other major parts of theology can attach to these things. And we'll talk about that over the course of the coming weeks. But foundationally, this is what makes somebody Muslim. Just the word Muslim, right? You follow Islam and you believe in Islamic doctrine if you follow this. You see? You then branch off from here and have distinct theological perspectives that now make somebody Sunni or Shia. But it falls under the fold of being Muslim because these groupings as two broader categories theologically still believe in these things so this is what Muslims believe and now you get to a place that's a little bit more nuanced right the Shia doctrine you have a belief in the imamate there is an understanding that Tradition assumes and teaches that authority was to be passed on through the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, male relatives. That will inform, inform authority, right? It'll influence like text and books and, you know, whose teachings do we follow for prayer? The Sunni theology, you know, understands kind of the greatness of all of the companions, for example, distinctly, right? And that informs also practice and ritual and teachings in different ways. But what you want to know is that it all fits under Islam. And then there's a branch that comes that then also has sub branches. You're going to have within the Sunni, as well as within the Shia tradition, distinct theological schools that also engage in debates across, as well as within, as they grow and develop, we're not gonna talk about a lot of those things, right? Because it's just like gonna be something that could be its own kind of course material and syllabus that people spend years and years. What we want to walk away with from this class is understanding what are the foundational theologies and how do we know and relate to who our God is in Islam. What do we understand of a theology around like prophethood and an understanding of a theology around afterlife? 
Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Any questions so far? I had one question. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kevin. Uh, one question on the, the first belief. Um, I see that many different religions or people you know, have quite distinct conception of God and what the meaning of God is. At this foundational level, what is, uh, is there a specific conception of God that Muslims yeah. believe in? We're going to talk about this a little bit today. We're going to look at a chapter that's a short chapter in the Quran that is called, uh, the chapter is called Ikhlas, Sincerity. And it speaks about a knowledge of God and how we can start to fundamentally understand who God is, right? So I want to start there with just understanding God and how we relate to God in Islam. It's a very pure monotheism, right? There's nothing between an individual and God in Islam. The name for God in Islam the name we're taught that God has given to himself is Allah. Right? And there's some different opinions on, you know, what this name actually invokes. In Arabic, the word for just God in general, something that is worshipped, is Ilah. And some people would say that this is the type of word that is got a root like base to it. Right? So is doing a definitive of a word that is denoting it's the God, right? Al-Ilah, elided together, is Allah. And some would say, no, this is not like a word that can be broken down, and it's just Allah. There's no kind of root to it. You don't have to like get into the nitty gritty. Allah is the name of God in Islam. The relationship now between God and his creation is rooted in just a fundamental concept that has the basis of two different words, Rab and Abd in Arabic. The word Rab gets translated quite often as Lord, and the word Abd gets quite often translated as a servant, right? So the word abd, to give you an idea, it essentially can translate as a servant. Like if you've heard the name Abdul, Abdullah, right? Or like Kareem Abdul Jabbar, right? Abdul Jabbar means the servant of Al Jabbar, one of the names we are taught of God. But something is an abd because at a base level, it requires or relies on something else to exist. That's the definition of an abd. That it's not self-sufficient. So this word states essentially and categorizes that everything that exists in creation is an abd. Because everything needs something. Everything is reliant on something in order to be, in order to exist. Does that make sense, right? This is where you start to get into a place, as Kevin is saying, like the essence of God in Islam, that the fundamental essence of God in Islam is distinct from creation, that God uniquely does not rely on anything to exist. Does it make sense? So when we're talking about one God, you want to think for yourself. We have a narration in our tradition that says that Allah says, I am as my servant thinks I am. So the God that you believe God to be is the God that you're going to worship. When you live in a society that's deeply impacted by other religious traditions, right? When you come into interactions with them, it creates now a distinction from Islam, not in the idea that there's one God, but the essential understanding of that God is different, right? We don't have a religion that believes in an anthropomorphized God in any capacity. We don't have an understanding that God is like his creation in any which way, shape, or form. 
Before we break that down a little bit, the word Rab, it gets translated quite often as Lord, but it means so much more than that. So if you look in an Arabic dictionary, when it defines this word Lord or Rab, it says the word Rab means Al Malik. The Malik is like the owner of something, the master of something, the one who's in control of something, right? If I'm the one that owns something and it's in my possession, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that like I get to decide how it's used fully. Do you get what I'm saying? Right? So you can be in a place where you come to my house and like, I bought my TV, but my kids are constantly the ones that decide what's being watched on the television. Do you see? They're the ones that are determining, like, how they're going to lay down on the couch, how they're going to, like, eat the food. You know, they're going to say, that's mine, that's mine. I'm like, no, no. You didn't buy it with any money that you have. That's not yours. The fundamental understanding here is that everything that exists is under the ownership of the divine. That's one part of being Rabb. Another part of being Rabb is that Allah says that He is Sayyid. That's the definition. He's the one that decides how things are used. The one that is kind of a decision maker, you know, so to speak. You have then the idea that Allah is Murabbi. And this word denotes like a caretaker, a nurturer, right? There's a verse in the Quran where we're taught to make a prayer for our parents who took care of us when we were little. And it says in Arabic, uh, right? that be merciful to them as they did care for me when I was a child. It's the same word, right? Rabbayani, murabbi. So God is the one that cares for you, is your nurturer, your caretaker. The way that good parents take care of their children, that's the way we understand God to be in a place where he loves you even more than a mother loves his child, right? The definition continues and says that God is Qayyim, Mudabbir. Right? He's the one that keeps things in place. He's the arranger of affairs. And it continues and it says that he's the healer, the mender of all things. So when we're calling upon God as Rub, it's not like Lord in the way that the English language would translate it, but it's within the sense of like God is the one that's really giving me everything. And I am not on my own able to be self-sufficient, but I am reliant upon things around me to exist. So why not then choose to be reliant on the one that is not reliant on anything? is what like Islam posits, right? Because everything else is going to have limitations. Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Any thoughts, any questions before we move on? So I want you to, if you have a smartphone, right? Or a computer, you can pull up. We're gonna look at a chapter that is called Surah Ikhlas. You can just type into Google, Right, uh, you can write Quran, Ikhlas, and it'll pull up like Quran.com. You can get a translation up. And this is going to be a really great chapter that talks about just the essence of God in Islam. Like, who is God according to Islamic theology? And as you all pull that up, on your phones and we can look at it. Um, I want to give you some like background on this chapter. It's a very short chapter. 
But what's essentially happening in real time is that the people of Mecca, their theology is different than the theology of Islam. So they have a polytheistic religion, right? This is not about knocking or judging anybody, but just to understand this as fact, like the Meccans practice polytheism. Islam was monotheistic. In their polytheistic religion, they had now also a divine entity that they refer to as Allah. And they were in a place now where, as this is happening in real time, they're saying to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that, like, we have Allah also. Like, who is Allah to you? Right? Is Allah made of gold? Is Allah made of silver? Right? Who are Allah's children? Is Allah the child of another God? These are questions that are being asked. And you want to not think about this when you come across text or articles in a way that like pits groups against each other. You see what I mean? There are people who are fundamentally going to ask questions. You are going to be in a place where as you explore Islam as a religion, whether you were born into it or not, that you're exposed to other thoughts and ideas and they're going to bring up questions, right? People are asking questions. The Prophet is responding to the questions. God is responding to the questions through revelation. Does everybody have it open in front of them? Uh, and you can open it with translation, right? The first verse will be translated as something like, say, he is the one, right? You know, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, he is Allah, the one, Ahad. Does everybody have it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this chapter is being revealed. And to give you context, it's a very short chapter. It's a chapter that talks about the fundamental kind of essence of the divine. In Islam, the knowledge that we have of God is qualified as a negative knowledge. Meaning that anything we understand God to be, we know that God is other than that. There's a verse in the Quran that says, Laysa kemithlihi shay, that there's not anything that's like a likeness to God. So anything that you would understand God to be, then you know that he is other than that. And just keep that in mind, right? So it's not a negative in the sense that it's pessimistic. It's not a negative knowledge in the sense that it's something that is rooted in sadness or grief. We're not talking about negativity in that way. Does that make sense? This first verse now has a kind of, it has like the most arguably primary essential kind of, understanding of the divine that we can be offered. The word qul in Arabic that gets translated as say, right, is used in the Quran as a way to illustrate something that is quite important. And it's a direct kind of imperative to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like say this, right, qul. You have the word huwa after that within the Arabic language gets translated as like he, and we'll talk about this at the end of this first verse, like how that relates grammatically, not like through a gender standpoint, because there's not anything that's like a likeness to him. So we don't have a male God in Islam. Grammatically, the Arabic language utilizes masculine, feminine kind of, you know, presence grammatically, but that doesn't mean that it's a, a male God, right? If you translated this into English, it's just also more emphatic. The huwa means he, right? It would be like me saying, like, say he is Khalid, you know, running the live stream, right? And you're like, why don't you just say like Khalid is running the live stream, right? Why does the additional he have to be in it, right? It's just to point out that much more, you know, kind of the presence of the divine. Allah is the name of God, 
We talked about that briefly. And now it says Ahad. Right? In Arabic, the word Ahad here is telling you that, like, he's the only one that is like him. If anybody knows Arabic as a language, the word for one in Arabic is Wahid. And one of the divine names that we're taught of God is Al Wahid. But this is one in relation to, like, his oneness as a divine being. But Ahad is very unique in the Arabic language. Ahad denotes that there's no divisible parts, right? The way this chair is made up of nuts and bolts and cloth and other stuff, Ahad denotes you can't break down this entity. Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Right? Ahad is saying, because people were asking the Prophet, like, tell us about your God. We already have a God named Allah, right? Isn't he just like our God? And the Prophet's saying, there's nothing like my God. There is nothing that exists that is like this God. Do you understand? It has a fundamental root now in what is kind of understood in theological texts you'll come across that is a word that's called Tawheed, the oneness of God, the unique oneness, like the only understanding. If you convert to Islam or you are born Muslim, you say quite often on a daily basis what we call the Shahada. The Shahada is the testimony of faith Right? This means like the oneness of God, Tawheed. The Shahada is the testimony of faith. It says, La ilaha, that there is no God. There is nothing worthy of worship. La ilaha, a complete negation. And then it says, Illa, except Allah, like one entity. Allah, that's it. So complete negation then informs absolute affirmation you want to ponder upon what this means because this is giving you in this chapter right we're not going to so much detail but the way that the Quran quite often gives us an insight into God in verses like this ahad, say God is ahad you sit and you start to just think God is Ahad. How is he distinct? How is he not like his creation? Well, you die. God does not die. You eat. God does not eat. You sleep. God does not sleep. That aspect that is rooted there, that has to be pondered upon, right? And this is in our theology, something that is an aspect of theology, there's principles of logic to it. That if somebody said to you, like, where did all of this come from? And you can trace back every single act to a cause that is the result of the act taking place. At some point, there has to be a point of origin that has no causation to it because how can something come from nothing do you understand and these are like essential aspects of the divine when we're talking about this we can have this conversation a very different way where i could talk to you about it in terms of like god's mercy god's compassion which we'll, we'll get to but at a foundational level when Islam talks about a theology of one God, it is not the same as other monotheistic traditions in the essential understanding of God. God is Ahad in Islam. There is nothing that is like God. Do, do you get what I mean? Does that make sense? 
Any questions, any thoughts on that? So you start to then extrapolate what is necessary and necessarily conceivable in relation to this point, but also then gives you an other aspect of logic-based reasoning that is rooted in what is necessarily inconceivable. When we're talking about God being Ahad, how can you have a God that eats and sleeps? How could you fundamentally have two gods, three gods? It's not to knock people's beliefs, but just to think about it, right? Which God has more power than other gods? Which is able to then be able to engage in overpowering? Do you see what I'm saying? Ahad says that there's not anything that is like this God. You can't think about God in that way. The way that you go into a physical prostration in your daily prayers, you exert a mental prostration in the recognition of who the divine is. Why is this important? Because you don't want to take a pathway to learning this religion that teaches you how to pray and what is impermissible and obligatory before you are taught how to celebrate the divine in your life. And you have to understand this fundamental, essential aspect of God in Islam, that other aspects are going to be there that you can believe one and not necessarily believe the other. Allah is Khalik, He's the creator in our understanding. You can believe God created everything without believing that God is like the most merciful of those who show mercy. One doesn't assume the other necessarily, right? But all of it is just understood differently. If you can understand it through the prism of this essential value, this essential characteristic attribute of the divine, that his uniqueness is absolute, right? He is uniquely omniscient. He is uniquely all-knowing. He is uniquely all-powerful. He is uniquely able to, like, hear, see all things. Before there was anything, there was God. After there is nothing, there will be God. He is the first. He is the last. All of this is rooted in Ahad, this term. The next verse that comes up, right, that says, Allahu Samad. It again is interjecting now just emphasis because it doesn't have to say Allah again. It can just say a Samad, right? If somebody has a translation in front of them, how do they translate Samad to you? Eternal and absolute. Eternal, absolute. What else does it say? Eternal. Eternal. Anything else? Sustainer. 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 Okay, great. Samad is also an answer to questions, right? So they ask the prophet, is your God made of gold? Is your God made of copper? Is your God made of silver? It's a polytheistic tradition. They have idols that they worship, right? This is just the way that theology is understood by the people at that time. The word samad has a few different meanings to it. One of the meanings is that the entity that is ahad is essentially with an internal vacuum, right? There's nothing that makes this God like the way you conceptualize God, the prophet is telling them. Like your God is made of copper, the idea doesn't parallel itself in Islam, right? We don't say that our God is made of something. Do you understand? Does that make sense? Samad also denotes like eternality, like you're saying, but what you hear, what you have here now is a stylistic point in the Quran where two divine names of God are given and they categorically are showing you different things. The first is the essence of the divine, right? It's telling you something about who God is, Ahad. 
Samad is telling you then, how does that relate to creation? So Samad is essentially like the source of refuge. The one that you turn to, right? The one when you're in a place of need, because you are abd. So you think about people that you know, who they just hit difficulty, right? May Allah make things easy for all of us, right? But a lot of us, right? Generalization is comfortable being made. Is that when you're going through difficulty, trial, tribulation, is a time when people remember God. You know, God, I'm sorry that I don't pray to you. I don't show up on Sundays the way I'm supposed to. I don't do this. I don't do that. Right? Like, help me in this moment. My loved one is sick. The doctors don't know what to do. Like, everything is just not working. I'm turning to you. That is a summit. The source of refuge. How do the two relate to each other? Ahad and Samad. If you just turn to the person next to you for a minute and just talk about this, right? Ahad, Samad. Ahad, unique. Oneness. Nothing that's like a likeness to God. Not able to be. It's not divisible, made up of parts. None of these things, right? Samad, the source of refuge, the eternal refuge, the one that you turn to. What's the link there? Do you get the question? If you just talk to the person next to you, share your names. We'll talk for two minutes, then we'll come back. What's like a what's things that come up for you in the link between these two? Okay. So what are some of the things that are coming up for people? How is there like a connection? How do these two like names of Allah relate to one another? Al Ahad al Samad. The one, the source of refuge. Everybody's talking, so I know you said something. <laughs> Wait, what did you talk about? Uh, well, well, actually, I was going to mention his point. But... Yeah, um, so uh, Tristan, nice to meet you, everybody. Um, uh, from interpretation, I thought of refuge as a wholeness, um, and then um, with God or Allah being indivisible, you can't see. Those will be the correlation of that. And then Anwar was saying that uh, because God uh, or Allah has the capacity for everything, that's why it would be the refuge because he's there to comfort you, you know, shelter you with everything that may happen. Great. Other thoughts? Do people say different things? Yeah, go ahead. You can say the same thing too. Yeah, your question. Yeah, what's your question? I don't know. You don't know what the question is. Okay, well think about what it is and then we can maybe talk about it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> um I think that um like your smith is to resist, so I was wondering about the connection between the root of the song and that. Samad, like, is is a is a refuge, you know? Yeah, more, more or less, right? Um, and when we talk about in the way of, of Allah, we're talking about um, a Samad as um, a place where essentially, like, you don't have to go anywhere else. Do you know what I mean? This is kind of like the end point here, right? I don't need to be with anyone else, right? Ahad. Like, Al-Ahad is the one that I just have to turn to in, in, in the end of all of this, right? And that's hard, especially if you're like a, a convert, do you know what I mean? And if you're not a convert and you're in this room, like my wife converted 24 years ago, 25 years ago, mashallah, you know? Um, it's not easy decisions when you're actively choosing to embrace something that quite often, like denying that you believe in it would make your life a whole lot easier. Do you know what I mean? And once it just resonates and it clicks, and you're like, well, what else, what can I do now? Like, I know this is true, right? But going through that place now where you nuance the understanding, that you could be like, yeah, I get that God is the one, that God created everything and all of these things. But if you make it devoid now 
of the aspect of asamad, of rab, of like mercy, of compassion, of nurturing, right? The idea isn't that you turn to God out of God's need for turning to you because God is free of need. But it's for your benefit to be turning to God at times when there's limitations on turning to God's creation, right? Like there's going to be people who are going to disappoint you. There's going to be people who are not going to support you or celebrate you or understand you. But in this tradition, like God is always with you. You know, God is closer to you, not in the sense of like the way you have animist religions, right? That says God exists in this tree, God exists here. It's not in that sense, right? But the presence of the divine is something that necessitates first a recognition of through just contemplation. Like, what is God telling me of himself in these ways? What does this mean to me, right? Like, how does that kind of fu function for me? Because there are a lot of people who be like, well, I get it. I even buy into it. But like, why, why would you want to like stop doing certain things? Why are you like, even, even like, I buy into all of this, but like, why, why like pray five times a day? Why do you like eat in this way? Why don't you just go do whatever you feel like, right? The basis of this knowing is not so that you engage in just weaponizing religion, do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, but what Islam posits, right? Another word for this chapter that's called ikhlas, sincerity, it was known as ma'rifah, the chapter was called that, which means like the loving knowing of God, right? Like you have an awareness of God because what Islamic theology posits is knowing and recognizing one God in this way is going to be the ultimate source of inward contentment. Is going to be the ultimate source of balance. You talk to somebody who converts to Islam, right? And they are dealt with like negligence from Muslims. People mistreat them. They like suspect them. They doubt, like not, people don't treat converts well. And may Allah make this a community where converts are treated well and find mm -hmm. themselves in a space where they find a home and a connection to the divine, right? They still believe in God after all of that. Do you know what I mean? And if you were to go to say to somebody, like, hey, if we were to give you all this other comfort, but all you had to do, right? This is what Bilal, who is a companion of the Prophet, he is a slave. He's African. He's not treated well in Mecca. And they put a boulder on his chest, telling him that recount your belief in this God that you claim God is. And when he responds to them, as the boulder is on his chest, he says to them, Ahadun Ahad, the one, the one. It's all he needs, right? That's, that's all. Because he, he believes in this God. He believes in a God that no matter what anybody would give to him, he's like, I can't shake that belief, right? That's like my source, my lifeline, my kind of place of contentment. Do you get what I'm saying? And then these last two verses, they give affirmation more on the essence of God. It says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad, that God, you know, does not beget nor is begotten, right? But this was like a Meccan source of pride. They didn't want to have daughters. They would bury their daughters alive. Female infanticide was a heavy practice in this socially inequitous society. And their, their understanding of God also was rooted in a theology that was absent of a belief in an afterlife. There was no sense of accountability. Right? We talk about afterlife, we'll talk about that. But here, their pride is in this idea, like, look at how many kids I have. Look at how many children I have. Like, our gods even have kids, right? There's not anything that's like a likeness to him. And so the idea that a all-powerful God would be able, would be in a place where there was children involved, right? Just creates this like challenge now to 
what is inconceivable? How can you be omniscient if there is another God that is also omniscient, right? How can you in, be in this place where you are omnipresent when you are situated to like specific locale, right? You exist in what we understand dimensionally to be like time and space in the way that we're experiencing each other in this way, right? There's literal theologies that said that the way you and I are in this moment, like that is how a child of God also came into existence. Do you, you see what I mean, right? And that's where like the reflection on it, just the contemplation on it, that you have to fundamentally understand that like belief is rooted in faith, but like faith also can be kind of discerned through principles of like logic at the end of the day, right? The last verse says, and there's nothing that's an equivalent to God, right? Kufu means equivalent, you know? So there's, there's not like an equal in that sense, right? Like when you're getting married, to give you an idea in Arabic, and they're trying to tell you like, how do you have like a suitable spouse? They tell you to look for someone that you have like commonality with, equivalence with, right? And this word kufu is used in that sense also in books of fiqh, right? The verse is saying like, there's nothing like God and it's affirming like the first verse that talks about God as Ahad. What I would like for us to do, we'll pick up on this part next week also and talk more about who God is, you know, other divine names that were taught. Go through your Quran and just see where there's like divine names mentioned of God. And do it as an exercise. You can't like open a page of the Quran without Allah being mentioned. As well as like things like afterlife and other stuff. So just as an exercise, go through it. The translation, like the Arabic, if you can read the Arabic, you know, any of it's fine, right? The ways that Allah helps us to understand him. He gives us like divine names mentioned in the Quran. That he is Rahman, like the merciful, like Rahim, like the kind of continuity to his compassion. We'll talk about what these words mean grammatically. You know, he describes himself as Latif, gentle, kind, Wadud, the source of love. Just find them, reflect on them, not in isolation of each other, but in a way that Islam as a religion doesn't anthropomorphize God in any capacity. So when you can understand mercy and love that is divine, through this prism of God being Ahad, it's a love and mercy that you can't even imagine what that is. Is like what, what we understand it to be. You see what I mean? But also just reflect on this. Like just think, contemplate, right? Be in a place where you use your intellect and to say, like, where is all this coming from? What is like a logical starting point to all of this? Our ability to have logic yields also that empirical evidence <coughs> is not the pure basis of information for us, right? And you can look at science and how it develops, and it's not like centuries ago, but more contemporarily in however many decades that they're willing to acknowledge the existence of like quantum realms and things that previously were not necessarily understood. I see here, I'll, I'll give me one second, yeah. You know, things that they have to like recognize that there's still unfamiliarity, right? And there's not a way to engage tangibly necessarily. Islamic theology does not rely upon empirical evidence to reach conclusions alone. You see what I mean? But you can go and engage by like just gazing at God's creation, reflecting on like how he defines himself through his book, and using like your, your intellect to kind of discern some of this. So I want you to just like think about this. There's companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who they would recite this chapter like every prayer one would recite it in the beginning he would read this and then read a portion of the quran another would recite a portion of the quran and then read this and people would get annoyed why do you keep doing this and then they didn't want to tell him and so when the prophet asks and inquires <coughs> the companion says that because this chapter it speaks about the essence the attributes of ar-rahman the most merciful and I love it for this reason, right? 
And out of my love for it, I just keep reciting it. And the prophet says, then tell that man that because of his love for this chapter, God loves him also, right? There's other narrations that say it's the equivalent of a third of the Quran. Doesn't mean if you read it, it's like you read a third of the book. But if you remember, we had like three foundational theologies. This is like one out of three, right? If you look at how theology is structured and the Quran is structured, there's so many different ways you can extrapolate meaning, but it's giving us like the fundamental of who we understand God to be in his essence within an Islamic framework. I want to move on to one thing before we wrap up. What were you going to say? I was going to ask, so what's the, pur- why, what's the purpose of using la um, in the surah instead of like la? Because la is past time, isn't it? Because la would denote something in the present, meaning that it could have been possible. Um, and he simply is not doing it now, right? But lam, grammatically, denotes that this is something that is more definitive. Do you see what I mean? Right? So if someone said, like, you know, don't sit, right? It doesn't mean that you can't sit ever, right? But this is like giving a categorical understanding that is like eternal understanding of who God is. Do you see what I mean? Couldn't. And I'm just this actual genuine question like sure because i feel like that same thing could be communicated in the presence of something like abdan like at all is used uh, uh so the purpose of the past tense and you said it was r- r- is a mecca so like i don't know it's more emphatic with the grammar this way and we could talk about it more different. right yeah. yeah but you have like different recitations of quran this is like a nuanced point, right? But some would say there's five verses to this chapter and not four. The recitation that we hear the most says like there's four verses to it, right? But it's like just giving definitive points, right? In response in real time, do you know? And they're hearing it like in real time also. Do you know what I mean? Um, so the utilization of even the last verse, وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ Right? That's not grammatically structured the way like a verse would be structured in Arabic, like if you were speaking in Arabic, right? But it changes it because if you were to read it in Arabic the way that it would typically be read, Allah would not be in the front of the verse, he'd be at the end of the verse, you see? But they're bringing Allah to like the, you know, the verse brings Allah to the front um, and like stylistically and grammatically, it also just has like this powerful meaning, right? That he's Ahad, like, He's in the beginning. You don't put him, like, you know, towards the end of it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. No, it's okay. I want to go through something, like, super quick, and then we'll, we'll stop. Because it's going to inform some of our, like, other discussions. Um, and this is now going into, like, practice, right? Because we're going to talk about how to wash up for prayer and prayer and fasting and charity. So there's a concept um, in... So there's there's... A few words that we want to know that you'll come across. There's something called usul al-fiqh. This is Islamic legal theory. And the way Islamic law builds itself, right? Like you have at the center Mecca, Medina, and the Prophet Muhammad. And then people like go, you know, in the immediate, all over the world. They come into interaction with different, like, individuals, people from different walks of life. Um, They're developing now legislatively, right? There's sources of Islamic law that we'll talk about next time. The Qur'an, the prophetic example, etc. Usul al-fiqh is Islamic legal theory. And fiqh is basically what refers to, some people would call it Islamic law. It's more like the legal rulings, right? So legal theory like sets the rules and boundaries to derive like the actual legal ruling, right? The word fiqh in Arabic means to understand, but it's like deep understanding, what we call fahm. So if I said to you like two plus two equals four, and I'd say, do you get it, right? Like conceptually, you'd say something like fahm in that sentence. Ilam 
is like knowledge, right? So if my son memorized, like two plus two is four, right? Two times two is four, two times three is six. Like he has it, but if I say like, hey, like show me how that is, he might not have fahm of it. He just has it rotely memorized, right? And fiqh is different from certain things. So you can have people who are scholars of a lot of different things in Islam. Somebody can know hadith, what's a narration that goes back to an action, a saying, or a teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, right? There's a well-known Muslim scholar from centuries ago whose name is Yahya ibn Mu'in, and he is known as being somebody who was very prolific in this science of transmitting like prophetic tradition. And somebody came and asked a question of him, and he's like the, the like kind of godfather of this science, you know? He's like a, a scholar in every which way possible. And a woman came to ask him, like, uh, my husband passed away, and I am in my haid, I'm menstruating right now, and there's nobody else to wash his body. Can I wash his body? This is a question of Islamic law. And in her head, she's like thinking that I'm not in a, like when, we'll talk about this in a few weeks, but if you are like bleeding incessantly, a woman is on her menstrual cycle, then she's not able to be in a state of like ritual purity, right? When you wash the body, you're like essentially kind of going through a, what would be a purification shower in her head. She's like, well, what's the connection here, right? So Yahya ibn Mu'in, he says like, I don't know, but next to him is a well-known like scholar of law, by the name of Abu Thor. They say, go and ask him, right? And so she asks him and he thinks about it. And then he says like, you know, this is fine. And he gives an example that the Prophet Muhammad, his mosque was like right next door to his house. And sometimes when he was secluding himself to the mosque, in Ramadan in the nights, he would like literally lean into his house and he would put his head in his wife's lap and she would wash his hair while she was menstruating. And so he says that, well, you know, if a menstruating woman could wash the hair of her husband when he's alive, then definitely like a menstruating woman could also like wash a husband who has passed away, right? The other scholar knew the hadith, but he didn't know how to extrapolate the meaning from it, right? That's what fiqh is. It's about taking the meaning from it. So it's not just enough to say, I know this verse in the Quran. I know this narration in the prophetic tradition. I have like a kind of literalist approach to it, right? There was a man who's a professor from, I don't know what college, but um, I'm going to be in a documentary on PBS on the Sabbath and they put a trailer out and I told them like we don't have Sabbath in our religion, right? So this professor saw the trailer and it's just like a five second soundbite of me. So he wrote to me, he's like my research is in this. I've been waiting to like see if there's Muslims who can tell me like if it's the same as in Judaism and Christianity. I was like, I'm sorry man, we don't have Sabbath in our religion, right? And then he sent me a verse from the Quran that says, doesn't this verse say that on Juma on the day of Friday, you go to Juma and you leave like your work behind, right? And I was like, yeah, but the next verse says, then go back to work when it's done. <laughs> you know what I mean, right? But he looked at one verse and he was like, well, that's like the basis of it. What the jurists would do is they would look at the entirety of a text, right? They would look at how all of it related to one another. Why is this important to you? Every Muslim does not know what they're talking about when they talk about Islam. And as you explore Islam, you're a convert to Islam, you're trying to relate back to Islam at a different part in your life, just because somebody's Muslim doesn't mean that what they're saying makes sense. And that's not a knock on anybody, right? But that's just fundamentally how it is, you know? And this is a big challenge that people have when they convert. A Muslim said this to me, so it must be true. It doesn't work that way. This takes a lot of responsibility and it has a lot of like base to it, right? We're gonna be going through texts that are essentially manuals that tell you like how to pray, 
That is a ruling that stems from this. The basis of this is basic that these people are trying to understand, have that deep fahm that we're talking about, because they're trying to do what God wants them to do. They're trying to teach us, like, this is how we understand what these texts mean in building our relationship with God, right? It's not so that you can have, like, the best posture of, like, all the people praying and you could say, I'm the greatest at this, right? But so that we can extrapolate meaning and say, this is how God said to worship him. This is how God told us to, like, treat our families. This is how God taught us to, like, take care of our kids. The orphans, the widows, right? Refugees, the incarcerated, all of these different things. So we'll talk about where they draw that from next week. But what I want you to familiarize yourself with is a concept in fiqh that's going to come up undoubtedly, regardless of whether you're Sunni, you're Shia, school of thought, no school of thought, this or that. These words are going to be flung in your face like crazy. Right? The first one that you're going to hear all the time is on this spectrum is going to be the word haram. It's like everybody's favorite word to be able to tell you, like, you suck at everything. Do you know? This is bad. That's bad. You're wrong. Right? It's crazy. Right? Yeah. Oh, I'm a teacher in the Bronx. The amount of times where my students will be like, Mr. Homework is haram. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You teach it, your students tell you oh, homework yeah. is wrong? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Literally, the word for homework in Arabic is wajib, which <laughs> means, like, obligatory. Right? <laughs> like, it's, it does not mean anything like that. So, haram, like, means, roughly translated, as strictly prohibited. It's not allowed. And at the other end of this, you have a word in Arabic that's called fard, which means obligation. For something to exist in either of these categories, and in Islam, everything fits into one of these boxes. And some of them are super broad, and the majority of them are going to fit in the middle one that we're going to talk about. And there's very few that are in these cases, but they exist. For something to exist in these cases, the text that is the evidence for it has to be decisive, what in Arabic is called qat'i, in both like text and meaning, right? Don't eat pork means don't eat pork because that's all it means, it means don't eat pork, right? Clear cut, you know what I'm saying? It's established here in this grouping, through text, that God is one. That there's five prayers that we pray that are mandatory. You're going to hear these words, like a lot, right? Quite often, they will be misused. And I'm sorry about that, but, like, it's okay, right? Just understand that the words are there. You have in the middle what is called mubah, or this is neutral. And you can even call this permissible. Most acts fall into this category, right? The color of your toothbrush, whatever. You know what I mean, right? A lot of things just are in this, because the default is that everything is this, unless there's a basis for it to be this or this. You see? Does that make sense? So somebody comes to you and they say, hey man, something is haram. You don't have to get into the business of like telling people constantly, tell me your proof, tell me your proof, tell me your proof. Where there's Muslims who do this, right? But you also have to understand that like people have to have a base to it, you know? I was teaching uh, something at like a gathering my dad hosted with his friends years ago and I was visiting home and he said, can you speak at this thing? And I said, sure. And they get together once a week and like look at Quran and reflect on it. And so I had talked about like a verse that talked about, um, you know, the importance of like self-purification 
you know, of your heart and these kinds of things, spirituality. And a woman came up to me afterward and she was like, that's so great, you know, but it would be amazing if instead of that verse, you talked about the verse that kind of was around it, that talked about things that were futile and pointless. And her son was standing next to her. And this kid's like 13, but he's also like six foot four. He's in this weird, awkward phase of life, right? You know, and he's like totally miserable standing there. And he's hunched over. And she said, you know, he plays video games all the time. You know, tell him video games are haram, right? And I was like, I'm really sorry, but I can't do that, you know? And he like stood up a little straighter, <laughs> got happy. And I said the word haram means something, right? When we say somebody commits a haram act, we're saying that they're liable for sin. The abstention from the act renders reward, right? That's like a mercy from God in our tradition that inaction in this regard also renders like increase in that sense, right? But it's not a word to just throw around aimlessly. You then have here in between a word that's called makruh and this means disliked and you have a word here that's called mustahab which means recommended these are the five categories that every action can fit into across like the board in Arabic, this is called the Ahkam Sharia. A hukam is essentially like a pronouncement from God on how humans should act. That's like what the word hukam means in a literal sense, right? It's technical definition. What happens in these groupings, there's also subcategories that'll come up in like individual schools as well as like across the board. So mustahab is recommended to do, right? These are things, if you do your fard, you get reward for it. If you leave it behind, there's sin in that. If you do the mustahab, there's reward in it. If you leave it behind, there's no sin. In Mubah, there's no reward or it's just, you're just doing whatever, right? Disliked is uh, leaving it behind is praiseworthy. The engagement of it, some would say, does not render sin unless there's continuity to the act. And then Haram, doing it is sinful and leaving it behind renders you reward, right? And we'll talk about what these things mean. Yeah. Uh, you might talk about it next, but I just want to ask, what makes something disliked and who decides it? Yeah, so here we have like distinctions also, but essentially what this does, it breaks down into another category that is now a prophetic recommendation, which we call a sunnah mu'akkadah. This is like something that was recommended that the Prophet would do consistently, regularly, right? And in Makru, uh, and what can get added in here, and tell me if this gets like too much, right? As we engage this regularly, it'll become more familiar, okay? This categorically is said to be more beneficial than just a regular recommended act because this is rooted in like what the Prophet would do regularly. You have in some opinions, an interjection here of the word wajib, right, which we just said meant homework. <laughs> but it's got a lesser relationship of obligation. And makru, people would break down into two categories. Makru tanzihi and makru tahrimi. And the basis of what your question is in relation to this is now how the evidences change from being uh, what we say are decisive versus probabilistic. And this relates to the theology we were talking about before, right? So if something is defined through 
decisive text and the meaning and the text is decisive, if one would deny that, then that becomes like a state of disbelief, right? These are not like emotional terms, but there's a difference between somebody saying, I struggle praying Fajr versus saying Fajr is not a part of Islam, right? Because it is clearly established that Fajr is a part of Islam. You move in this direction, and this is one of the reasons why in the Hanafi school, they say Imam Abu Hanifa very purposely sought to add distinct layers of categorization, where he made now a differentiation between Fard and Wajib and separated the Makruh from the Haram in a layer, so as to also ensure that as more people came into Islam, non-Muslim lands, that the act of this or the denial of it doesn't render one to be outside of the fold of Islam. Do you get what I mean? Versus if somebody says something is haram is permissible categorically, it's not that you're in a state of kufr, like emo, but you're just creating your own religion at that point, right? You know? And that's essentially what you're saying. I don't like fall into what this religion says, right? So I think Islam says we pray twice a day, right? Well, no, like it says you pray five times a day. I think Islam says like drinking alcohol is fine. No, like clearly it says like it's not. Do you know what I mean? If you struggle with it, that's very different than saying it is a part or it is not a part, things that are decisively a part of it. And so here, what you have are then distinct texts, right? So what is something that is makru, for example, not like getting into this part, but up here, right? Like wasting water when you make wudu, for example, right? You're washing up for prayer. And you're just like, unnecessary, you know, water's running, I'm like talking to Khalid, you know, we're not even washing anything and the water's just flowing, right? Can you say it's haram? Yeah, if you keep doing it again and again, they'll say like the continuity of that behavior, that's a problem, right? But in and of itself, like a one-off, it's not an issue in that sense. Do you see what I mean? And then here the distinctions would come in you know, like based off of um, the kind of the, you know, the different ways that things could also pair up, right? Because you could have something that is decisive as a text, but it's kind of probabilistic in meaning, right? Or you could have something as probabilistic as a text, but decisive in meaning, right? Or something that is probabilistic in both instances. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So all actions will fit into these buckets right why is it important because when we talk about wudu we're going to talk about this right there's a verse in the quran that tells you like that you wash in these ways right but you're going to see that there's obligations to them and then you're going to see there's recommendations the order in which you do your wudu the number of times that you wash a body part the inclusion of your nose your mouth these are not from the obligations they are recommendations. And we want you to become equipped with your understanding of fiqh that allows for you to understand it now circumstantially also, right? I had students that went sledding in Central Park and the fourth prayer of the day, Maghrib is coming upon them, small window, the sun is setting, right? They have to pray and they don't have wudu. And they're in a place now, like what do we do, right? We're in the middle of the park, it's like getting darker, and there's snow all around them, right? We're gonna talk next week about the types of water you can make wudu with. You can make wudu with snow, right? But it's snow, do you know what I mean? So in the washing of our part, body, we're washing like our hands, our face, mouth, nose. This is your typical wudu, right? Are these guys gonna shove snow in their nostrils three times, right? Are they gonna gargle with snow in their mouth three times? No, right? But this is why you have to know it so then you can apply it in certain situations, right? We're going to talk about what does it mean when you're in the workplace, you're in a classroom, you know, and it's not so easy. I was in the bathroom in Kimmel and like I was in the men's room, I was making wudu and I had my foot in the sink, you know, and I like, there's a lot of, pr my job is to be Muslim, right? So, you know, whatever, right? So my foot's in the sink, I'm washing it. This lady walked into the bathroom and she looked at me and her eyes got really big because my foot's in the sink. And I don't know if she freaked out, 
because she like saw like me washing my foot in the sink she realized she was like in the wrong bathroom she just stared at me for a while and then just kind of like walked away and I, I didn't know what to do right but you don't have to do that when you're going to your workplace. We're gonna talk about like what this means in terms of different ways that our FIC can allow for you to like be comfortable in your places of work, right? I wear boots, for example. You can make wudu and you can, in a state of wudu, put on like something that is recognized as like a footwear, right? And as long as it fits certain criteria, you can walk a certain distance in it without it ripping. You know, it's not perforated, so water seeps through it. It goes above your ankle, like these kinds of things. Then you can just simply wipe over that. Does that make sense? But we want to talk about this like with specifics. I don't want you to just memorize something. And then when you're out in the real world, you're like, man, like I'm in school. My kids are telling me like homework is haram, right? All my teachers in the teacher lounge, like why does this dude got his foot in the sink, right? You, it's it's something that you can like ease your way in certain ways. Do you, you get what I mean? And there's ways like the more we know it, we can understand it. But we're gonna use these words when we're talking about things. So you wanna familiarize yourself with them, that things will fit into this category. The last word I wanna share in relation to this is the word halal, right? Because you don't see it up here, but you quite often, like for New York City, Halal carts, halal food, halal chicken and rice. It's like everywhere, right? Where does it fit in here, halal? Anything that's not haram. Huh? Anything that's not haram. Potentially, right? Just permissible. Huh? Just permissible. Halal, like, is allowed, right? Quite often paired against haram. So, definitely, like, this and this and this all fits into it even to a certain extent like this can fit into it do you know what i mean and when we distill it into these categories like this you know quite often is just referencing like things that are haram pretty much but there's so much more that is permissible than what is impermissible you see so that's where like the kind of relationship exists between that word halal and the word haram when you're saying something is halal, you're saying it fits into like these boxes. When you're saying something is not like halal, you're saying it's haram, then it's just like in this one kind of section over here, right? You, you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Okay, we're gonna take a pause here. I'm sorry we went over time. How did this go for people? It's the first time we did this. This is kind of what people are looking for. Yeah, any thoughts? You can tell me like, you know, Amazing. Great. Any other thoughts or questions as we wrap up? Okay. Okay. Salaikum. Thank you.